It's so hot here, it's 40 degrees in the shade. After traveling for 24 hours to get here by plane, I'm wondering why I ever thought that coming here was a good idea. I'm exhausted, but I can't afford to relax and spend much time here in Marua, my starting point. I've got to reach Chad. Chad. A place not only known for its civil wars, militias, coups, and kidnappings, but also for its desert, nomadic tribes, and the lake after which Chad is named. Now that this country is no longer in the headlines, what has become of it? How do people live? First things first, though, I need to organize a vehicle. Here, this one's a good car. Take the keys and remember, never buy petrol, that's from Nigeria. The locals get this petrol from the border. They travel by bike, only at night, and it takes them two days to get it and bring it back. Where do they sell it? They sell it here, along the roadside, in those one liter bottles. Because the petrol is often mixed with water, the car can catch on fire. Water mixed with petrol. It's very dangerous. These black market traders sometimes tip off carjackers. Several travelers have been caught in this ordeal. Bon voyage, à bientôt. Enjoy the journey. Bon voyage, I hope you, you get to see a lot. Voir plein de choses. Et ciao. I've been told that the roads here are very dangerous. I'll be traveling along the border of Nigeria. Nigeria has Africa's largest population and is one of the most unstable and violent countries. Carjackers, gangs that appear from nowhere, who threaten you with their powerful automatic weapons and vanish back into the shrub, crossing back over the Nigerian border. All these stories are very unnerving, so I've decided to hire a policeman as a guide for my own protection. I feel like I'm turning my back on the Western world and heading towards the unknown. It's a bit frightening, but quite exciting at the same time. My journey begins in the heart of Africa, in northern Cameroon's most remote area, Rumsiki, bordering the Mandara mountain range. People of the Kurdi tribe live here untouched by the white man's ways. I will drive north towards Chad, stopping at the Waza Game Reserve. Then I will reach Jamina, located along the Sherry River, continuing all the way down to Lake Chad, also known as the West African Sea. Heading towards desert land further north, my trip will end in Mao, where one first sees the dunes of the Sahara. This journey follows the same route as the camel trains who transported gold and ivory. It's also an opportunity to meet different people and discover Chad, this unknown country. A storm builds on the horizon. The rainy season is about to begin and will move towards the north. These dry and rocky mountains are surprisingly one of Cameroon's most densely populated areas. The Kurdi people have lived here since the 17th century, and my guide tells me that during national elections, a candidate will never win without the Kurdi's support. They escaped the invasion of the nomads, and they resisted the Islamic beliefs. Using only their bare hands, they built terraces along the steep mountain slopes to enable them to cultivate maize. I'm looking at these remarkable rocks of petrified lava, which were left here some 30 million years ago, when the whole area was nothing more than active volcanoes. I recall André Gide, who in his travel notes, described this place as one of the most beautiful places on our planet. My guide, Jean Victor, is himself a Kurdi. The mountain is called Zivi. It's 1,100 meters high. And do people live around here? Yes, people live everywhere around here. See, there are signs over there. It's here where people came to build their houses and cultivate their land. That's why you see all these rocks neatly aligned. And there in front, there's a small hut which is used by the hunters. 
During the rainy season, the hunters keep watch to prevent the monkeys from destroying their maize or stealing peanuts. This old man is one of Rumsiki's most mysterious characters. He lives here with his many wives and children. According to Jean Victor, he is a true wise man who can predict the future using small crabs he collects from a stream at the foot of the mountain. I must meet this man before going any further. <laughs> I want to introduce you to the village wise man. His name is Damra Malgro, the witch doctor of Rumsiki. To tell the future, he places a crab amongst a maze constructed from small sticks. The crab must move them in certain directions for him to tell future events. The witch doctor takes another sniff of snuff. This must help him maintain concentration. Tell me, witch doctor, these people came from far away to visit our country, and they're taking the road towards Chad. They would like to know how their trip will go. After a period of deep contemplation and a long wait to allow the crab enough time to work itself through the maze, the wise man interprets the position of the sticks to tell whether the news is good or bad. If there are to be problems, the crab would have placed the sticks alongside these little red buttons. According to the wise man, everything will go well during your travels. No problems. He also asks if you have anything else you'd like to know. Well, the predictions are good for what concerns me at the moment. But my guide cannot resist the temptation of asking the witch doctor about his own future. Even though it may be a bit dubious using crabs to predict the future, the witch doctor nevertheless plays a very significant role amongst the Kurdi tribe. He is given the same level of respect as the village chief. He said that all will be well for your family. This advice reassures the policeman. We must now leave the witch doctor, all his wives, and most intriguing of all, his precious crustaceans. It seems as if time has stood still here despite earlier threats by tourism. Nowadays, due to the lack of security and the poor state of the roads, tourists have become very rare. Cameroon is a large producer of cotton. Here, the ancient weaving methods have remained unchanged. The weavers, mothers and their children, spend whole days weaving their fine threads. These hidden areas within North Cameroon harbor some extraordinary people. I am about to meet one of them. He's a man who lives in one of many stone huts on the mountainside.
My name is TJ. I am 75 years old and have four children and 12 grandchildren. How many wives do you have? I have had many, but I have only one left. TJ invites me into his home, or concession, as he calls it. Between the huts for the women is the peanut reserve. Over there is where they brew the beer which is prepared for ceremonies and celebrations. Judging by the number of huts, he must have had quite a few wives. Climbing onto the roof of the grain reserve, he now shows us his precious maize. At last is hut, where gatherings often lead to heated discussions during the rainy seasons. Before the arrival of the white man, we Kerdi came here to protect ourselves from the Pud, Muslim invaders. We used to live on the open plains where we farmed and cultivated the land. But the Pud, they were stock breeders. They ransacked the whole area and forced us to leave. That is why we came here to the Kapsiki, where we developed new areas to grow our crops. We settled here about 200 years ago. And tell me, these weapons here, do you still use them? I always have them by my side, even when I'm on the mountain. I use this to fight against a pud. To attack someone, you go like this, one step back, and then like this. This shield was made from buffalo hide and is very solid. This one here has been punctured and has taken some hard knocks. What does the mountain mean to you? The mountain protects us as it has in the past against the invaders. Its caves and alcoves provide cover and the mountain is sacred to us. When someone is sick or we have a poor harvest, the chief the midwife and all the villagers drink their home brew and dance all night long at the foot of the mountain, praying for an end to their misfortune. The old man tells me that this music and dancing is performed during special events like weddings, births, circumcisions, and exorcisms. I don't know what they're celebrating tonight, but I think the visit of a white man is perhaps a special occasion. We even invited the midwife from Room Siki. She seemed very pleased to be dancing in front of me. She is the matriarch of the village, and it is impossible to find out her exact age, as birth registration probably didn't exist when she was born. very touched and somewhat embarrassed that they are dancing in my honor. But I can sense a real connection through the music and rhythm. The beer obviously helps. The party can go on all through the night and well into the next day. One of the most important people in Rumsiki is the blacksmith, and the Kurdis think he has divine power. My guardian angel and I paid him a visit. He uses a traditional wax method to create his art. For this, he sculpts his model in beeswax, covers it with clay, and then bakes it in the kiln, at which stage the wax melts away and a mold is formed. What do you do as the blacksmith to the Kurdis? I make tools and ceremonial pieces like knives, bracelets, and genital shields. When there's a death in the family or a woman has difficulty becoming pregnant, it is my role to sacrifice a chicken at the foot of the mountain. All these methods were passed on to me by my grandfather. 
This is my son, and he's now learning these methods as well. Nearby, a hamel is located a few meters away from their homes. His ability to transform metal into tools and art makes him as important as the village chief. More than just an artist, he is also the village doctor and master of ceremonies. During these ceremonies, he conducts the music as well as playing the flute. The forgery is very modest. The walls are made of stretched leather and a small foyer to house the equipment. When the metal is hot enough, it melts into the shape of the mold. And with a little water, the object is cooled down before breaking the mold. This is a delicate operation. Do you ever have any accidents? Yes, sometimes it breaks during the cooling down process. If it happens, then we have to start all over again by simply melting down the copper. Is this a hammer? No, it's for weeding, but it's used more often during ceremonies by the chief. It is very valuable, and it can be exchanged for a sheep or a bag of maize. What is your baby's name? My baby's name is Kusume, and my name is Koda. How old are you? 29. How many children would you like? Personally, I think, since I am healthy, four children. My mother had 15 children, but there are only seven of us now. All the others, they're gone. Does your husband have any other wives? No, only one for now. Maybe he will have more one day, but for now I am the only one. If one day he tells you that he now has another wife, what would you say to him? Nothing. We will stay together with our daughter. How will you share the roles in your home? It's okay. We will all work together. Will your daughter go to school? Why not? Her older sister goes there, so she will go as well. Did you learn to read and count at school? I have never been to school. Not even one time. Okay, but for you it is important that your children go to school. Yes, it is better. If I had been to school, I would probably be doing something better than this. Before, girls were not allowed to go to school. It was only for boys. As I wasn't allowed to go to school, I stayed home. I grew up, got married, and never went to school. I don't even speak French very well. I make many mistakes, and I don't know how to read or write. I must ask my oldest daughter for help. It's a shame. It is better that I send my children to school. I didn't know how to write the bill you asked for, so I had to find a boy outside to help me. It's not right, is it? That's why I want to send my children to school. Although I've enjoyed my visit and discussion with Koda and her little restaurant, I need to continue my journey north and there is no time to waste. I have to arrive at my next stop before nightfall, the National Park of Waza. The road is difficult and the average speed is only 30 kilometers per hour. Fortunately, the majestic scenery distracts me from my discomfort. Whilst leaving this curdy region, I reflect on how this dry and desolate savanna, burned to a crisp at the end of a long dry season, is the home of these farmers who toil the land for their survival. The cattle travel freely, 
crossing the frontier between Chad and Nigeria, never needing any visas. Approaching the park, we can see two huge cliffs standing like two giant statues at the entrance to the reserve. Having 170,000 hectares, Waza is not only large, but is one of the most beautiful animal reserves in West Africa. The tour guides, who bring visitors close to the wild animals, are all from the local villages. The human population has tripled in the last 50 years because of a massive influx of refugees from Chad. The area has difficulty protecting itself from the ever-growing needs of the population in terms of farming, agriculture, and firewood for heating and cooking. How can one protect this area, I wonder, without hindering the increasing needs of the people? Perfect. Over there, next to the waters, are marabous. Here, one of the few water holes left during the dry season, is where I met Saleh Adam, director of the park. We have over 300 species of wild animals here, including elephants, giraffes, lions, hyenas, several types of antelope, buffalo, and hippopotami. These are roan antelopes. Can you see them? There is a large male over there. Can you see him? The species which brings balance, or should I say imbalance, to the park is the elephant. They create so many problems. Mohammed. There are elephants over there. It is a herd of elephants. Are there many elephants in Waza? Yes, there are many. Over 2,000 elephants. When a group of over 300 elephants leave the area at the beginning of the wet season to travel to the south, they destroy everything in their way. They spend the entire wet season in that area and create many problems for the local people when they damage their crops. Last year we were trained to use pepper gas to scare the elephants away from the area. The gas annoys the elephants by creating a burning sensation so they quickly run away. Do you have problems with poachers in Waza? It is very easy for the poachers to come from Chad into Waza and do as they wish. They come with a very clear intention and are incredibly well armed. So, how do you protect your animals from these poachers? Well, we explain to the local people that it's in their best interest to protect these animals as they benefit from their existence. What's astonishing is the difference in flora and fauna found inside the reserve compared to outside. In fact, the locals are not allowed to remove any wood from within the park, nor are the farmers allowed to cultivate this area. The reserve is intact, protected from any possible bushfires. If they had not transformed this area into a reserve, much of this natural environment and wildlife would probably have disappeared from the region by now. At the entrance to the park, there is a small restaurant run by locals. Working in this restaurant is a way for the ladies of this area to earn a living. Here's my chance to observe how they prepare the food. In this case, they are cooking chicken with peanuts. 
This restaurant is a good example of how the local community works in collaboration with the authorities. After a pleasant night of recuperation and air-conditioned comfort, I set out once more on the road to Chad. This part of Cameroon is about 20 kilometers wide, an ideal area for carjackers. If I can pass through this area safely, and if all my papers are in order, I should arrive in Jamina by nightfall. There is only one bridge which crosses the Shari River. The same ethnic groups live on both banks of the river, separated only by a borderline dating back to colonial days. This bridge has a grim history. During the Civil War in 1982, people ran across it, fleeing for their lives from the Libyan forces allied with Gukuni Wedai. She's an orphan and a gamina. J'ai grandi parmi les chars et les canons. Ma vie est une longue histoire au triste. J'ai vis dans le brouillard d'une guerre qui ne finit jamais. Sans frère ni soeur, je pars pour les rues de Jamena. Originally named Fort Lamy. Jamina was established by the French during the 1900s. The city stretches along the banks of the Sherry River, and its name literally means Tree of Peace. It's sad to think there was ever a war here. In my mind, I expected to discover a city of ruins. Today is Sunday, so despite the city's 500,000 inhabitants, it feels like a small town. It was recommended I have a drink at Leopold's, a surprisingly unique restaurant. So, here is the airplane, and it's not an Air Afrique airplane. It was the presidential plane used by General Maloum during his term. As it no longer flies, it was bought by a local entrepreneur who turned it into a bar. It was quite difficult transporting the plane from the airport in one piece, so we had to remove parts of the wings to bring it here by truck. Once here, we built the fence around it. Can you show us around? Sure, no problems. Follow me. Tables and chairs are now where passengers once sat. And the DJ with the sound system, he's now in the cockpit. Leaving the somewhat grim streets of Jamina behind me, I make my way towards Dukia where I will spend the night before arriving at Lake Chad, which I am keen to discover. The road meanders along the banks of the Shari River for about 100 kilometers or so. The Jamina region is the meeting point between the populations from the south, who depend on fishing and agriculture for survival, and the nomads from the north, who are more like shepherds. As we get closer to the desert, I feel the air becoming drier. It can't be far now. The presence of some dromedaries, though everyone calls them camels here, means that nomads must be nearby. I ask a young local boy, Amat, to lead me to a group of nomads and help me with any translation. At last, here they are, the famous men of the desert. So different from the others we have already met on this journey. Amat, ask them why they set up camp here, 20 kilometers from Jamina. The river nearby, so there's plenty of water for them to drink. Are they your camels we saw on the way here? Yes, they're ours. They're drinking. We also have goats, but they will return tonight. How long will you stay here? Well, between two to three months, until the rainy season begins. So, if it's God's will, then we will return north to Mao, in Kanem. Oh, 
How did you build your tents? It's simple. We use pieces of wood and canvas. To build this campsite, it took us about three hours. But up there towards the north, our houses are made of clay brick. In two months, it will rain again in the north. So we will pull down our tents and load them on the camels and return to Mao. Up there, the wet season lasts two months. Because of their nomadic lifestyle and their continual search for water, their children do not go to school. Very few nomads know how to read and write. It seems as though their animals are better vaccinated and cared for than themselves. There are 300,000 nomads here, which make up 5% of the population in a country that is four times the size of France. I'm told there are some hippopotami beside the estuary. Hippos are very dangerous animals and cause many accidents in Africa. Despite this, a small Christian community of fishermen have settled here, in Muslim territory not far from these animals who don't seem to trouble anyone. Delam Simon is the head of the family. I have lived here for years. In fact, I arrived here in 1972. I am of Kim origin, which is from the Mayo Kebi area over there. I came here for adventure, so maybe it was God's plan for me to be here. Anyway, I am here now. Are there any problems between the children and the hippos? No, no, there are no problems with the children. Sometimes they get very close and play next to the hippos. Ever since we arrived, we have lived amongst the hippos. They are a large group, over 100 of them, and they spread out when the dry season begins. There are some over here, and there are others which have found another watering hole. They spread out all over the place, which is why we can only see a few of them today. Apparently you have given them names. Yes, we have given them names, but just nicknames. This one here is the chief. Of course, there are other males, but as he is the largest, we have given him the name the general, as in general of the brigade. These large traps, made of branches and wood, have been open for 20 days. The fish have become used to the branches and have made them their home. Today is a special day because the traps will be closed. The children who are on school vacation have come to help. The fish will be sold at the markets for around one euro per kilo. These people are very different from the nomads I met last night. Their lifestyle, religion, and language seem a world away, yet they only live a few kilometers apart. Today, I will have a chance to fly over the lake. A small airplane has arrived from Jemina to pick me up at Dugia, where there is a dirt runway. The only things missing are a control tower and a windsock. Lake Chad nicknamed the Caspian Sea of Africa. It's like an ocean. After an hour of flying, we reach the Bol region. Here they have built dams to aid with irrigation. It is an amazing sight to see these fields of wheat in the middle of the desert. They harvest three times a year. On our return, we fly directly over Kanasaram, a fishing village, which is only accessible by boat. I look forward to discovering this place up close. From above, it looks like the perfect place for bandits to hide out, being at the junction of three countries. Before landing, we take one last look at the Sherry River, which snakes its way slowly towards the lake. Oh, <laughs>
Here at Gite, the road ends and our boat leaves for Kanasaram. My first priority is to find a guide to take me there. The guide must interpret the local dialect since they don't understand chatty in Arabic or even French. <laughs> the lake extends into four countries, Chad, Cameroon, Nigeria, and Niger. There are often tensions at the borders, so I find myself once more being escorted by a policeman, this time a blue beret. Have you been fishing? Yes, we've been fishing all night. We come from Kinaseram and have now finished our work. My police escort is an expert translator. The negotiations are well underway between the boat owner and the captain. In their opinion, a white passenger requires more attention and work than that of a local Chadian. Everything has its price, and with the negotiations now finished, we can proceed. Nature here is so perplexing. The blending of colors, the greens and blues, the foliage and the water. It is an amazing combination. I can't take my eyes off this place for a second. This is the way André Gide described Lake Chad. Boarding the boat was challenging, and we nearly fell into trouble several times. Because the lake is shallow, we have to travel fast to avoid getting snagged. We end up running aground, and our trusty boatman comes to our assistance. Hey, the, the ground is moving under your feet. You're sinking. What are you standing on? These are islands made from floating shrubs. It's dangerous to walk on them like this. And if you're not careful, you can slide through and drown. These bamboo wrapped like islands are moved around by the wind, causing the lake to change course often. Now the surface of the water extends as far as the eye can see. It's like an ocean, more spectacular from this perspective than looking down from the plain. Racing along, we pass many different groups of fishermen on all kinds of boats. Do you enjoy fishing? What else is there to do here? I'm curious what kind of fish these people are catching. They're originally from Gore, which is three hours away by boat. Because reeds have made it impossible to catch any fish in Gore, they were forced to come live here in Kanasaram with their families. After fishing all night, they are now ready to sell their catch at the market. A little further along, we pass a group of people who appear unfriendly and refuse to speak to us. They allow us to come near them because I have a chatty and policeman on board. They are nomadic fishermen from Nigeria. One of the children working on the boat has jumped into the water and slaps to encourage fish to enter the net. This is hard work for these young eight and nine-year-olds. It wasn't that long ago that the people from Chad and Nigeria fought over the right to fish these waters. If their silence is any indication, this must still be a sensitive topic. The Nigerians have had to fish in more concentrated areas ever since the lake's water level dropped. These fishermen spend up to two to three days on these trips, sleeping on board at night.
our boat is now racing through the channel. I feel as if I could be thrown overboard at any moment. We're heading straight for Panassaram, where the fishermen sell their catch like tilapia, carp, and Nile perch. Drying and salting is the only way to preserve the catch, since there is no refrigeration and the temperature often exceeds 45 degrees in the shade. The heat is oppressing. There is a strong odor of drying fish. I am welcomed by Musa Masaye, an experienced fisherman from the village. We catch either small or large fish. The large fish are both carp and capitan, and we send them to Jamina to be sold at the market. The small fish are smoked or dried, and they will be sold at auction in Nigeria. The smoking process is done here and is done by placing the fish on grills over some ashes. For the drying process, the fish are rubbed with salt to keep the flies away, and then we hang them up and leave it to the sun. We made this net here with fishing string from Nigeria because we can't afford to buy the imported nets. We are all fishermen, and there are no fields here. Fishing is the only thing we know how to do. Our children fish as well, but there are less fish than before. It's becoming harder for them. It is God's will. The lake also covers some very valuable crude oil which has not yet been tapped. Will the people here be able to preserve this fragile ecosystem despite the effects of fishing, farming, and perhaps oil exploration? They call this the road of the Italians as it was constructed with their technical assistance 20 years ago. But because of the harsh conditions, only small remnants of the road remain, set amongst some very large potholes. The only way to continue on is to keep to the side of the road. I'm missing the cool air from Lake Chad. We only pass several convoys and small trucks, so overloaded that I wonder how they ever make it. Sometimes, the road even seems to disappear between the sand dunes. It is very difficult to drive on the sand, and I even got stuck. Lucky for me, a truck stopped, and all the passengers hopped off to help me. I recruit an expert driver for the rest of the journey. With all the mechanical problem and prayer stops, it has taken me a day to travel some 200 kilometers. I won't be in Mao till late tonight. It was so hot I slept outside on the ground. My back, after having been subjected to that bumpy road yesterday, is repaying me this morning. My throat is scorched by the dust and dry heat, but all this pain is surpassed by a curious sensation that I have arrived in a place back in time. The nearest telephone is more than a day's drive. The local airport runway is buried under a sand dune. Mao is a genuine melting pot of different cultures. Pul, Tuvu, nomads, and Islamic Chadians. I want to visit the oasis around this area, but first I must fill up with petrol, and the town's pump is a true collector's item. Here in Kanem, people bargain, negotiate, and exchange goods. Nearly everyone here makes their living from livestock. In fact, it is the second largest source of income for Chad. Today is market day. I have never seen so many dromedaires in one place. There must be over 2,000 of them here. 
In the midst of all this commotion, I have met a true businessman, Raim. Does he come from far away? He's traveled about 15 kilometers like this. He is a nomad. Why is he here at the market? He is here to sell his cattle. Can you ask him how much he is selling his camel for? About 250 for this one. 250,000? Yes, yes, 250,000. 250,000 CFA francs. That's 380 euros. This seems very expensive, especially since the average monthly income is no more than 60 euros. Of course, the dromedaires not only provide a means of transport across the desert, but also supply a terrific source of milk. There are over 750 oases around Mao, and they call them wadis. My driver suggests I pay a visit to Mohammed Chuku, a man who has the reputation of being the best gardener in Canaan. Along the way, we pass an old rocket left over from the war. Further north, there are even unexploded landmines. They believe there are over a million of them in Chad. In this oasis, the water collected from previous wet seasons lies only two or three meters below ground. The farmers can cultivate everything, including date palms, corn, and sugarcane. The old Mohammed is very proud to show his vegetables to me. It is not every day a white man comes to visit. In this oasis, we grow all kinds of vegetables, cabbage, beetroot, radish, or even potatoes. They need a lot of water. The well supplies us with water all year round, yet it would be better if we had a motorized pump. But we don't have enough money to buy one. It's not yet ripe. They'll be ready within a month or two. The papaya plant, it's simple. You plant it, you give it a lot of water, and six or seven months later you have fruit. Some of the best tasting fruit in Canem. Everyone applaud. This gardener's big smile will be my farewell. The voyage is drawing to an end. I must get ready for my return. A convoy has arrived where I left my equipment. This intrusion of the modern world is in stark contrast to a place standing still in time. Hello, Wolfgang. Hello. Hi. What are you and your team doing here in Mao? In Mao, we are just passing to come to Jamena. We are on a trip coming down from Europe which is absolutely crazy in three weeks. And we wanted to see Tibesti Mountains, which was not possible because of an unsilent political situation. And so we couldn't find any guide uh, guiding us around in the Tibesti. So we decided to go parallel to this road in Chad uh, through Niger. So you've come here seeking adventure? Yes, uh, my adventure is to pass all these police and uh, stations and, and, and customs. <laughs> this is enough adventure. After Jamina, we just uh, extend our trip down to Douala in Cameroon. And then we ship our vehicle back that we are ready for preparation the vehicle uh, for next year. The area further north, where these rugged tourists came through, is an adventure that beckons me but I've swallowed enough dust, from the Kurdi mountains to the dunes of Canem. Soon, I will return to the modern world, far, far away from here. Oh.
Chad, a country not well known by the outside world, hard yet inviting. For me, it is no longer a place synonymous with war. This country will change when they exploit their reserves of crude oil. I guess it will provide the people of Chad, one of the poorest yet most generous people in the world, with a chance 